In this video, we're going to take a look at the first house built in the United States, made entirely from sight cast concrete and glass. It's a true masterpiece of brutalist architecture. It was built in the 1960s, but demolished in 1999, meaning that no one will ever be able to visit it again. So we're going to model the building digitally and explore it with a real-time walkthrough to discover what hidden discoveries are lurking inside. Stay tuned. Hello, my name is Stuart Hicks, and I teach architectural design studios and lecture courses at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Every once in a while, you come upon a building that just seems like it slipped through the cracks of history for whatever reason. Just looking at this house, I'm in awe that it ever existed. It made a splash when it was built, but then it was quickly forgotten and never found its place within the history books. Maybe you never want to live in this house, but I'm sure glad that it existed at some point. It's a bold experiment and novel construction techniques applied to a house and done in a way that has never been tried before. Not only that, the architects took complete advantage of the building techniques to create shapes that are only made possible by doing it in this way. And finally, it leads to supporting a completely unique and a thoughtful way for a family to live inside. It's called the Lincoln House, designed by Mary Otis Stevens and Thomas McNulty. And in this video, we're going to take a deep dive to learn a little bit more about it. We're going to model it in the computer, and then we'll walk through it using a program called Enscape. I've included a link in the description below where you can tour the house yourself without any special software. So let's discover more about this house together beginning with the timeline. The Lincoln House was built in 1965 in Lincoln, Massachusetts, from which it derives its name. It was designed principally by Mary Otis Stevens in partnership with her husband, Thomas McNulty, for their family to live in. Mary Otis Stevens was born in 1928 in New York City. She studied philosophy at Smith College in 1949 and was active in the civil rights movement until entering architecture school at MIT or the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1953. While attending MIT, Mary stood out for both being one of the very few women studying architecture at the time and approaching the field from her activist and philosophy background. She crossed paths with a number of pioneering architects while at school, including Aero Saarinen, who was a visiting teacher there. He would, of course, go on to design the sweeping, curving concrete roof of the TWA terminal in New York. The director of the school at the time was Walter Gropius, a prominent figure of the Bauhaus who moved to America, bringing with him the sensibility of European modern architecture and who built his own house in Lincoln, Massachusetts, which was born from his thoughts about modern homes and how families might live in unique ways. Also in the era at the time was an excitement for a set of investigations into the utility of concrete construction that would begin in the 1940s and find its name, Brutalism, from an essay written by Rainer Banham who linked this work to Béton Brut, meaning raw concrete in French. These folks found beauty in the unfinished nature of the utilitarian material and sought to showcase its possibilities. In addition to the material's texture, it can also create flowing curves as much easier with this type of construction than others. But back to Mary Otis Stevens, who met her partner Thomas McNulty while studying at MIT, where he had just graduated and began teaching. After Mary graduated, the two got married and started practicing together until 1969 when they founded an architectural book publishing company called iPress, which existed until 1978 when the two divorced and ended up selling the house to a famous opera director named Sarah Caldwell. In addition to publishing books about movement and the city, they would do a few important projects together, including the Wolf Trap National Park for the Performing Arts. However, the Lincoln House remained their most notable work and was demolished in 1999 to make way for a much more ordinary house with much more money. The Lincoln House was designed by the architects for their own family to live in, and thus it embodies a level of experimentation and personal views in architecture that wouldn't really be possible otherwise. It was perhaps the first house built in the United States of entirely concrete and glass. It was built along a north-south axis and located on Weston Road, near Beaver Pond, surrounded by bushes and trees. The architects were interested in three things in this design. One, showcasing the possibilities of rigorous use of concrete construction. Two, ideas about movement, flow, hesitation, and stasis and three, reimagining how a family might live together. While this isn't the order of importance for the architects, I'll talk about each one of these in this order. The house uses a high lime, cast in place concrete that creates a lot of color variation that the architects really appreciated. The concrete was poured into the tops of forms that were lined with two inch by 12 inch Douglas fir planks. To save on cost and materials, these boards were reused between the castings, and this 12 inch module would supply the size of the segmentation for the curvature of the walls. But some of the walls had a curve which was too tight to make, so they cut the boards down to make the segment smaller, and it had to do this these ones last because they couldn't reuse those boards anymore after they'd been cut. All of the curves of the house, coupled with the roughness of the concrete, made it feel both like a sculpture and like a piece of geology or landscape. 
and in order to heighten this effect, there were no doors in the house. All of the enclosures and openness was achieved with curves, walls, and space. In Mary Stevens' words, the curves were throwing you out rather than holding you in. Each projected its energy into nature. We use the invisible power of the concave wall to relate the building beyond its site to the woods and the fields of rural Lincoln. She also said that we wanted to make the house like a miniature city. It was very urban. The idea was to bring people together, not isolate them in boxes on different floors. You had choices all of the time. fostered movement not only between the different areas of the interior, but also between the inside and the outside. Although there was one regular front door made of steel and glass, there were actually six other points where one could gain access to the outside on the ground floor. And these were sliding glass doors between undulating walls. The intention was that they really didn't have to read as doors, just as openings. Most of the building is quite open at the heart, where we have the entry and circulation, the living, and the library. Uh, the library sort of protects the dining, and then, then at the ends we have the kitchen and the staff areas, and on the other end, um, the children's zone. And most of these are really open, but then some exceptions are the bathrooms and one bedroom off the kitchen, which they call a guest room, but I suspect it's the staff room. But even the bedroom's walls don't really connect to the ceiling, so the bedroom could join the flow of the rest of the house. And Mary Oda Stevens says that you needed to keep moving in order to take it all in. The inherent movement of the curvilinear geometry kept pushing you dynamically through the space, rather than confining you to one vantage point. She goes on to say that there were different ways of going back and forth, as in a city. This allowed the children to bypass the living room, and the grown-ups if they wanted to, although they were seen. You didn't have to engage with people directly. You could if you wanted to, and in moving through a space you could look for options. You might want to be in an introverted piazza. You might want to be the introverted streets or the side streets. But the important thing is that you have the chance to choose. Building the Lincoln House in 3D was a challenge. First off, there were a few straight lines. There are a number of different radiuses of curvature, with tangent lines springing from them at all sorts of angles. Walls aren't a single thickness either. They vary in thickness depending on the degree of curvature. There is also no underlying grid that we could find that would help to align some of the walls. And although the house is mostly on a single floor, it's not very flat. The floor is constantly ramping or stepping up or down. And the ceiling also steps up and down, creating very dynamic spaces, but also creating difficult to understand relationships between the elements. However, the house was well documented. Even the famous Julius Schulman photographed the house, so we have a lot of reference material to work from in order to ensure that we got it right. So let's see what it's like to explore the Lincoln House. to the house feels like an alien reaching out for us, and as soon as we enter, we're pulled into and through the house with the curved walls. The space sucks you in, where we're presented with fragments of architecture coming together. We're never presented with the entirety of a shape, or an element like stairs, or even a room. We're only given a glimpse and then encouraged to see where it leads. The central stair is like the spine in the alien, allows us to orient ourselves. It can be pretty easy to not know where you are. The curves are all kind of blend together. However, we are given a concert of long views and short ones. Some views that look across or through many spaces, and others that just terminate at a wall. 
Skylights help illuminate spaces and drag light down onto the textured concrete walls. No single space feels like a real destination. Everything is in between. We're on our way to somewhere else. That remains true until we get to the library, which is more of a closed circle. But even here, there are very distinct ways out, both to the sides and up to the second floor and out through the skylight. There are connections and variety everywhere we turn. We're always presented with choices of where to look or where to go. Going upstairs feels like we're slipping between realms, up and down and side to side. And finally, at the top of the stair, we arrive at their office where we can look outside over the landscape or watch how the light caresses the curved wall below the skylight that funnels down to the library. Wow, as I mentioned, this house is absolutely incredible. I cannot believe that I didn't really know about it before this. The geometry of the plan is so unique and so precisely composed. Exploring the house, I'm struck by just how unresolved everything feels, but I mean this geometrically. You're always seeing glimpses, fragments, and pieces. And when I think of the flowing shapes of the house, I would have expected it to feel much more holistic, or much more encased or enclosed in different spaces. But that's really not the case. The house encourages you to keep moving, to go somewhere else. And now the house has gone somewhere else itself. But I hope that experiencing it with me, or on your own in the link below, will inspire you to appreciate this architectural experiment. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like with a thumbs up. Leave a comment in the comment section down below on your thoughts of the Lincoln House. You know, it's not really a commonly known building and maybe our discussion can build some awareness and collect people's thoughts about it. And while you're at it, please consider subscribing to the channel and hitting that bell button for you to be able to see more videos like this when they drop every week on Thursdays. Our next video in this series will be another important demolished brutalist house, and it's not very well known either, so you don't want to miss that. In the meantime, if you haven't seen them, you might really enjoy the video that we made on the Goldenberg House or the demolished U House. See you all next time.